Our next speaker is a Cook County Board President. She has just earned a second, four-year second term. She is a frequent attendee at City Club of Chicago events, for which we are enormously grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Preckwinkle. Madam President. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very grateful to be here. As it happens, President Cullerton is one of my favorite people in the state legislature. He was uh, very helpful to us when we were down in Springfield last spring trying to get our pension reform bill passed, and he was good enough to help us get it through the, the state senate, and I'm, as I said, I'm deeply grateful to him. He's also a, a very smart and talented guy, and uh, for those of you who haven't been privileged, a dead-on mimic. Uh, I have seen him do <coughs> any number of impersonations which I found interesting and fascinating. Um, my understanding is the Daly family, after he did a number of these impersonations of our former mayor, Daly the First, um, asked him to kindly cease and desist. Um, a very talented guy. He's come uh, frequently to this body to talk about the state of the state. I hope you will welcome him warmly. He's a graduate of Loyola University and Loyola University Law School. Those of you who are Loyola folks. He and his wife, Pam, who is with us today, are the proud parents of five beautiful children. Ladies and gentlemen, President John Cullerton. Boy. Thank you very much. There must be a lot of lobbyists here today. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the City Club for the invitation to speak here today, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. And I would at this time like to introduce uh, some members of the General Assembly. There's a number of senators here. The first two I'd like to introduce is Senator Rezin and Senator Althoff. Thank you very much for coming. Two Republican state senators who did not vote for me for president of the Senate. <laughs> but there is a Republican here who did vote for me, my counterpart, Senator Christine Redonio. Senator Redonio, thank you very much. And now I'd like to introduce the Democratic senators who did vote for me. Uh, <laughs> Senator Daniel Biss, Senator Dan Katowski, <laughs> Senator Napoleon Harris, Senator Toy Hutchinson. Senator John Mulrow, Senator Tom Cullerton, Senator Melinda Bush, Senator Michael Hastings, Senator Staines, Senator Heather Staines, Iris Martinez, a leader, Senator Jackie Collins, Senator Terry Link, one of our leaders, Kwame Raul, State Senator Kwame Raul, the President Pro Tem, Don Harmon, Senator Don Trotter, another leader, and my other roommate in Springfield, Senator Tony Munoz. I am also honored to have my two state reps here, Ann Williams and Sarah Feigenholz. Thank you very much. And I understand there's two more state reps, Representative Zaluski and Andrade. Andrade. I want to thank you guys for coming, and I will not tell the speaker you were here. Don't worry about it. Don't tell the speaker. They're not supposed to be here. Now, I didn't forget anybody. I got a list here. If Kimberly's here, I'll introduce Senator Kimberly. What's your name again? Come on, do that thing when you do when we're in leadership. Kimberly, Kimberly Lightford and Senator Bill Cunningham. Okay, anybody else? Okay, I think we have a quorum. I think we have a quorum. And of course, I'd like to introduce the most important person here today, my wife, Pam Cullerton. Now, I hope to see all of you back here on April 14th for a presentation uh, by the Lincoln's Challenge Academy. 
It's, uh, this program is in its 43rd class of students and provides thousands of at-risk teenagers with a new start. It's a great program, and I say that not just because my wife is on the advisory board. So April 14th. It's a real pleasure to be here. And now, if you uh, have been here before, you know that traditionally, I would break out my pie charts and walk through the state budget in an effort to get everyone to understand how our finances work. But these are different times in Illinois. We have a new governor who recently unveiled his proposed state budget. It should make people who haven't paid attention to the state budget start paying attention to the state budget. After all, it's our first real glimpse in what Governor Rauner's Illinois will look like. And it's not pretty. His budget devastates middle class families. He slashes college funding by one third. He slashes funding to local communities by more than half a billion dollars. He slashes millions from programs that keep seniors in their homes. He slashes public transportation by nearly 40%. Governor Rauner sees the budget as merely a math problem. I see the people behind those numbers, people struggling to get ahead. So I'm going to put away my pie charts and try something different. Today I'd like to introduce you to Loretta Schaefer. She's a 20-year-old Illinois State University student. She's attending college thanks to a scholarship from the Department of Children and Family Services. This is a state agency that protects children who have been abused and neglected. It's probably best if I just let Loretta tell her story. I was really, really little and my younger sister was a newborn baby and um, my mom had substance abuse problems and so she had left us one day um, and I don't really know how long because I was just a toddler but I guess the neighbors called and I was in and out of the system um, from there on out until I was adopted by a lady who was our babysitter. My mom got a newsletter from DCFS because um, she adopted me when I was pretty old so I was like almost 14 years old um, and she was like well if you want to go to college here's your ticket um, and so I would read the bios of all the students who, who had received it um, all through middle school and high school and just kinda tried to like craft this this idea of like a college ready scholarship worthy student DCFS traditionally is just a place that produces statistics about what kids that come in and out of the system are like and how often they return back to exactly where their parents were and how often that cycle repeats. I don't plan to be a part of that statistic and I think um, having the opportunity to go to college really breaks that cycle and how when our government values um, children who were previously in DCFS as more than a number, um, that's when we're going to see success and growth. So, Governor Rauner's budget eliminates her scholarship in his budget, along with the scholarships of nearly four dozen other students. These students have survived childhoods of abuse and neglect and have emerged as rare success stories. Loretta's scholarship cost the state about $500 a month. $500 is less than what it cost for your table here today. It's such a worthwhile program that last year, a bipartisan group of lawmakers pushed through a law expanding it. We have other programs that help foster children and other wards of the state transition into living on their own after they turn 18. Governor Rauner's budget eliminates all of those programs. The Chicago Tribune last Friday had a front page story detailing the devastating effects of those cuts. Not only are the scholarships gone, but also our job training, housing support, and pregnancy and youth counseling. Happy 18th birthday, congratulations, you survived DCFS, good luck finding somewhere to live and work, and good luck with the rest of your life. That's his budget. Now if, you all, now, if all you know about the state budget is what you heard from Governor Rauner's speech last month, this might be a bit surprising. And that's why I'm here today, to explain to you who really pays for Bruce Rauner's Illinois to show you why, in my opinion, his budget is unworkable as it is unconscionable. It's not just foster kids bearing the brunt of the budget acts. It's middle class families paying for college. Governor Rauner slashes 31% from the state support for the University of Illinois 
and all other state universities and colleges. That means massive tuition increases. That's another $200 million hit to the University of Illinois at a time when state schools have nearly doubled tuition and fees over the past decade. As a result, today's students, on average, are saddled with more than $28,000 in debt by the time they get a degree. And that was before the governor proposed slashing even more. You will also have to pay for Bruce Browner's budget taking a train or bus to work. Browner slashes the RTA by nearly $130 million. That means you will pay more and wait longer for buses and trains. There's also bad news for Amtrak fans. The Rauner budget slashes state funding by nearly 40%, sparking a debate over whether to charge more or run fewer trains. This cut comes even as Amtrak ridership has dramatically increased. Ridership on the train to Springfield is up 25% over the past five years, and ticket revenues are up 48%. The Illini and Saluki trains connecting Chicago to Champaign and Carbondale report a 22% increase in ridership and a 30% increase in ticket revenue. Rauner's budget turns the clock back on that progress. It means students will have fewer options getting to and from college. It means more people on the roads. And I've only scratched the surface of what Bruce Rauner's Illinois looks like. AIDS and HIV services are slashed six million. He slashes $23 million from early intervention programs for children and their families. Bruce Rauner's response to the ever-growing suburban heroin epidemic is to slash $2 million from the programs that fight heroin addiction. In addition, the governor, who wants to reduce our prison population to save money, turns around and cuts funding for other substance abuse programs that are, you guessed it, alternatives to sending people to prison. I probably could have saved a lot of time and simply told you who's not hurt in this budget. There's the wealthy, and then there's the corporations. The only cuts they received were to their tax rates. This budget is not the shared sacrifice he promised in his inauguration speech. His budget wipes out billions worth of services to the abused, elderly, and disabled, while shifting costs to the middle class families. At the same time, it maintains every single tax loophole that's ever been created. To be fair, there were some bright spots in the governor's budget, and I do want to work with the governor to find savings. For instance, Governor Rauner fully embraces President Obama's Affordable Care Act. He predicts the Affordable Care Act will save the state millions by picking up cancer screenings and other services that had been the state's responsibility. It's a bold move, given that so many of his GOP counterparts are talking about repealing Obamacare should they end up in the White House. And I applaud the governor for making early childhood elementary and high school education a priority. He proposed nearly $500 million increase in education funding. But he didn't tell you how he pays for it. Guess what? He slashes all state funding for art education, agricultural education, nationally board certified teachers, and foreign language classes. Those cuts are a mistake, especially from a governor who says he wants to make Illinois more competitive. Foreign language education is a vital part of the planning for the global economy. But don't take my word for it. Former Illinois Chamber of Commerce President Doug Whitley has called increasing language skills imperative in making our state competitive. And the governor, who not so long ago headed tourism efforts in Chicago, failed to mention what his policies will do to our city. He wants to cut $130 million in state funding that goes to Chicago. That means either massive property tax increases for homeowners or laying off nearly 1,000 Chicago police officers or firefighters. That's Bruce Rauner's plan for Chicago. We can't let that happen. I won't support any efforts to raise Chicago of its fair share. Eroding state support for the city, which is the economic capital of the Midwest, won't make Illinois better, and Governor Rauner should know that as well as anyone. So this is my seventh city club address since being elected Senate president in 2009. A lot has happened since then. It's too bad Governor Rauner and his team weren't here for some of my pie chart presentations. <laughs> uh, we've tried a lot of innovative policies, and we've worked with the Republicans to do that, to save taxpayers money since 2009. We passed a sweeping Medicaid Reform Act in 2012 known as the SMART Act. It saved 2.7 billion dollars. In it, we initially cut 
preventive dental care. A year later, we restored preventive dental care because it turned out some of our Smart Act reforms were not so smart. When you take preventive dental care away, dental problems fester and become medical emergencies. Then people go to the emergency room, and it's 10 times more expensive, and savings disappear. Governor Rauner wants to reenact the dumb parts of our SMART Act because he needs savings now to make his budget look balanced. Governor Rauner's budget repeats past mistakes. Too many parts of the budget plan are short-sighted, savings that ultimately cost taxpayers more. That's what happens with the community care program. This program helps seniors stay in their homes as long as possible by offering periodic services ranging from home-delivered meals to personal care. I qualify because I'm low income. Uh, I had a pension and the person who ran the trucking company uh, disappeared with everything. So I went from having something to having nothing. And because of my back injury, I was a truck driver, I had really nothing to go back on. The program provides a caretaker for me who uh, comes out once a week. I probably wouldn't be able to be here because I wouldn't be able to uh, take care of myself. I would probably have to go to an assisted living uh, uh, home. And I just feel there my whole quality of life would be taken away. So it, it's helped me to improve because I can still feel I have worth and some self-respect and independence. By pe putting people in the nursing homes, it seems like they would cost more. It seems like it would be more reasonable, cost-effective, if people can maintain as much of the quality of life as they can by themselves. And all we need is a helping hand. We aren't asking for someone to be here 24-7. The community care program has grown in recent years because baby boomers, like me and many of you, are all aging and every day more and more of us become eligible, need some help, and want to stay in our homes. The governor slashes over $100 million from the program. As seniors like Ray lose services, they end up in nursing homes. Nursing home care is covered by state taxpayers and is far more expensive. Then there's the governor's pension savings plan. So Governor Rauner proposes sweeping cuts to existing public employees' benefits. But then he goes ahead and spends the alleged $2.2 billion in savings to make his budget look balanced. Here's the problem. What if it doesn't pass? The last pension reform plan only got 10 Republican votes in the Senate. We need 30 votes to pass laws in the Senate. It was a similar story in the House. But let's pretend the governor somehow rallies his Republicans and he gets it approved. Then there's the guaranteed lawsuit that will be tied up in court for at least a year. That's what's happened to the pension reform plan we approved in 2013, Senate Bill 1. That case finally goes before the Illinois Supreme Court on Wednesday. So it's unwise to count on those savings, let alone go ahead and spend them in next year's budget, since you're not going to get them right away. It's not a real plan. Even Wall Street isn't buying it. By now, some of you are assuredly thinking, OK, I get it, but come on. John Cullerton, Mike Madigan, and the Democrats that run the General Assembly aren't going to cut funding for DCFS scholarships and children on ventilators and care for the elderly. No, I'm not. But this isn't my vision for Illinois. This is Bruce Rauner's Illinois. That's what his budget does. So Illinois finds itself at a crossroads. What do you want your state to look like? What do you want your state to do? Who do you want your state to help? I'm not looking to start a fight with our new governor. I want to work with him, but I don't work for him. And his budget doesn't work for Illinois. I'm not interested in turning Illinois into Kansas or Indiana or Mississippi. I'm interested in furthering <laughs> Mississippi always gets a clap. <laughs> I'm interested in furthering our elite status in the world and continuing to make Illinois better for all the people who live and work here. In Illinois, in my opinion, we've long been compassionate and competitive. It's my hope that we'll do an even better job of it. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today and be happy to answer any questions when Paul Green comes up and allows me to do so. Thank you.
All right, if you have questions, uh, we're, boy, there you are, young lady. Give them to raise your hand. Well, half these people work for you. Uh-oh. Uh, Miss Preckwinkle, you break all the rules, but you're Miss Preckwinkle. Go ahead. Didn't you just introduce me? Well, the first thing we want to do is sit down and work with all the leaders, Republican leaders as well, who we've worked with very well, Senator Rodonio and I, over the last six years. And my first suggestion to the governor is, let's plug the holes in this budget. Uh, whatever we do is going to have to be in a bipartisan fashion this year. And in the past, the Republicans, because the Democrats were in control, didn't vote for the budget. But this year, they will. And so it's going to have to be a compromise. So I think at this stage, we are doing what I'm doing today is pointing out the dramatic effects that these cuts have on the middle class. And that's what I'm trying to do. And I turn to the governor and say, you're new here, but the first uh, attempt at a balanced budget is not uh, successful. Come back with a balanced budget. We have a question. My old pal Bob Manwith, where are you, Bob? Raise your hand. Well, we're in the corner, old WGN hand. Uh, if, nice question, if the state Supreme Court kills the pension reform bill, will you support restoring the temporary income tax, in, temporary income tax increase uh, and a lot of the other new, let's leave it at that. Would you support <laughs> restoring the temporary income tax? Well, first of all, with regard to the pension bill, I worked to pass Senate Bill 1. It wasn't easy as I mentioned, 20 Democrats, 10 Republicans. Because I'm not on the Supreme Court, whether it's constitutional or not, it's not up to me, and it's in court now. So far, the lower courts have found it to be con unconstitutional and, and have said it, we can't enforce it. So we're going to wait and see what the court says, and perhaps the court, if they don't find it constitutional, will tell us uh, what we can do to make it constitutional, if possible. But any revenue issues are no longer up to myself and Speaker Madigan. Right now, everything has to be in a bipartisan fashion. And the governor's the one that has to propose a balanced budget. So we're going to look to him to tell us how he wants to plug the holes in this budget. And then we'll negotiate with him, and we'll, we will have a bar, bipartisan solution by the time we're done. I'm not sure what month it'll be, but <laughs> we'll have a bipartisan solution. Okay. Uh since there seems to be a lack of uh, written questions, uh, uh, the moderator will break all rules and for breaking them. 1991. Hmm. Go back in your Wayback Machine. Some, you go back that far. Huh? Yeah. Remember there was a contest between uh, Jim Edgar and Neil Hartigan. And there were two temporary tax increases. Uh, and Governor Edgar kept one of them and made it permanent. Why can't we do that again? Well, uh, 1991 was the first year I came to the Senate. And uh, what happened was Governor Edgar ran against Attorney General Hardigan, I believe. And Governor Edgar campaigned on making the income tax uh, permanent at 3%. The Democrat was opposed to it. And he won the election. And so he had the support of the people that voted for him. And so we went ahead and did it. So again, it still comes back to the governor. The governor campaigned on lowering taxes and spending more money on education. So the problem is he doesn't have a balanced budget, and that's his responsibility. So we're going to look to him to see how he wants to plug the holes. Good answer. I hope the reporters put that in the paper. Uh, uh, any, any, any other questions out, out there? Boy, they're coming in slow. It's a, it, it's a dribble. All right, Jeffrey from the uh, from the Haymarket Center. You mentioned proposed cuts to substance uh, abuse treatment, but federal dollars for substance abuse depend on a match of the state funding. How can we avoid cuts to our federal funding? Good question. Yeah. You know, um, I was just at the Haymarket Center. We were there for a, a 
presentation by AT&T that gave uh, a contribution to the work that they do on the west side, uh, people with uh, substance abuse. And from what I understand, the governor's budget cuts it in half. And is, is, uh, I, I just can't imagine uh, how that is a good long-term solution. Because once again, it, it doesn't really save the money. It just pushes the uh, services that are needed into a more expensive setting. And as far as any money that's matched by Medicaid, any of these cuts mean you're losing federal dollars as well. So it doesn't make sense to do it. Okay. Two questions more. Uh, John P. O'Neill from Baker Engineering. What role does increased infrastructure investment play in the success of Illinois' financial future? Yes or no? Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, that's, that's really, uh, I'm glad you raised that question about capital. So a lot of times, even reporters, if you can believe it, don't know the difference between the operating budget of the state and the capital budget. So when we raise money to pay off bonds that we sell so that we can build stuff like roads and bridges and highways, uh, it creates jobs. The benefits stay here and they're long term. And so when I first got elected the same day as Senator Rodonio uh, back in 2009. We worked together on a capital bill. And it did involve fee increases and some tax increases. The Republicans voted for them just like the Democrats. We passed the bill. Over 440,000 uh, jobs, uh, $28 billion. And so it's time to do it again, but it requires leadership. So I'm optimistic. The governor hasn't made any. Uh, statements about it, he hasn't ruled it out, but it's gonna involve some, you know, you gotta come up with some money, guys, to pay off those bonds. So I'm looking forward, once again, as we did uh, seven years ago, to do a bipartisan deal, because the problem is that the gas tax, as we get more fuel efficient cars, or if you buy an electric car, you don't pay anything for the roads. And so it's a declining revenue source, we have to make up for it some way, and that's why it's so important. And I'm looking forward to working with the governor and the Republicans on that. Last, last question from uh, Patrick Giordano. Great combination there, by the way. Okay. <laughs> from Giordano and Associates. The low, the low carbon standard and clean job legislation have both been introduced. Do you see a compromise? Why don't you explain what they are? So. Uh, yes, I see a compromise. Thank you. Hey. He didn't get that president's job because he was lucky, okay? How about a big round of applause?